Hey everybody. Um, over the next two weeks, we're going to turn our attention to um, the question of how civilians experienced the Civil War. We're going to read about civilians encountering death and mourning in Drew Faust's book, um, and then we're going to read some primary sources written by civilians during the war. Um, so I want to begin today's lecture with just a quick overview um, of civilians' experiences, uh, why they are significant, um, why, we, why we even care about what civilians experienced during the Civil War, and then we're going to shift gears and we're going to think about some of the major military turning points in the year 1862, what's happening in that year, which is really one of the purposes of the, these lectures, right? In, um, in our readings and in our discussions, we focus on lots and lots of different topics. Um, and so what I'm gonna try to do here is just give you some content um, to fill in any gaps, okay? Uh, perhaps I will spend the time defining something or describing an event that maybe you've heard of before, but you weren't quite sure what it was. Um, so I hope you find these helpful. Um, but just, just to start here, um, why do ex civilian experiences matter? Uh, what can they tell us? Um, for generations, really, for, for most of the history of the study of the Civil War, right, um, certainly the first hundred plus years after the war, the scholarship of this, of this event was about um, generals and it was about battles, and it was about um, high politics, right? Presidents, um, leaders in the Senate, um, advisors, etc. And this was called headquarters history, right? Headquarters because it was about the big time decision makers um, and the decisions that they were making. Uh, so at the beginning of the semester, I said there's something like 70,000 books about the Civil War. A huge number of those are actually about a kind of small number of topics um, and drawn from a fairly small number of sources, which is those produced by these leaders. Um, perhaps, perhaps some of that scholarship would focus on the, the experiences of individual soldiers, but, but frequently not, right? The sources that we read last week, um, the letters of soldiers, uh, those weren't going to be very significant to early historians of the Civil War. It just didn't matter, or they hadn't found them yet too. They weren't necessarily available. Um, but since about the 1970s um, and increasingly all the time, scholars who write and read about the Civil War, they often focus on the social world that the war created, the ways that average people uh, survived the experience, how it changed them, these kinds of questions. And those are the sorts of things that we're gonna be thinking about for the next couple of weeks. Um, and I would argue they, they really matter because the war wasn't just what was happening on the battlefields, right? The war what was, ha was what was happening everywhere on the continent, right? It was every little pocket of society that was affected by this conflict. Um, there were towns throughout the South but, but also towns in Northern New England, uh, towns in upstate New York, who lost half or more than half of their male population between the age of 18 and 45 during the war. So obviously that's, that's a cataclysmic event. It's a tragedy. It's an enormous loss. But think about that as well as a social problem, right? That's the labor power of the community. A significant portion of the labor power of the community is gone forever. It's also the reproductive power of the community, um, right? These are men who will not come home um, and have children, right? Who will not procreate. Um, so it leads to pretty profound changes in demographics for generations to come. Uh, the numbers of widows skyrocketed, the numbers of orphans skyrocketed. Um, and to fill in the gap for all of these missing men, not only the dead, but just those who went off to fight in the war, the working lives of everyday people changed very dramatically. Um, and these experiences in turn affected the war effort, right? Drew Faust and a number of other historians have suggested that one of the great vulnerabilities of the Confederacy wasn't something that was on the battlefield. It was instead Southern white women who used what 
little political power they had to um, weaken the war effort, right? They did things like uh, pressure their husbands to abandon uh, the army and come home. They rioted for food because many of them were starving throughout the war. The Confederacy really struggled to feed civilians, especially after 1863. Um, and they pressured local uh, power brokers, local, local people who had some influence in Confederate life um, to, to stop the war. As we read last, as we're going to read next week, and as we read a little bit of in Drew Faust in the week ahead here, um, many Southern white women were also the most fervent, the most dedicated supporters of the Confederate cause. I'm not saying that it was, it was strictly male support, right? Um, but uh, there were significant numbers, and these are especially poor, non-slaveholding uh, Southern white women um, who really have a dramatic influence on Confederate life. Um, civilians, I guess is what I'm saying here, civilians were the strength behind the armies. Um, it's in part uh, what happened in the North um, was dramatically different than what happened in the South, right? There was so much more pressure on Southern civilians. Um, and as they are starving, as they are feeling the great pressures of the war, they are less and less able to support the effort. Northern civilians, on the other hand, um, despite the great strains, despite the great pressures of the war, they're able to continue investing in war bonds. They're, they're directly paying for the war effort. Um, they're able to continue supporting the effort all the way to its conclusion. Okay. Um, but we're gonna deal with all of those questions in greater detail for the next two weeks. Right now, I'd like to turn to some military questions. Uh, what were the military and political turning points of uh, 1862? So I thought we had some really strong discussions last week about why soldiers fought the war, um, how they understood the purpose of the war. What I'm hoping that you saw, among other things, was that um, the Northern worldview was incredibly complex, right? I think some of you were, were quite surprised by the racism that you read among Northern soldiers. Um, it would be wrong, I think, to, I, I know, it would be wrong to claim that Northern soldiers did not care about the issue of slavery, right? Even though we saw all of that grotesque racism, that harsh, um, uh, animosity at best towards um, enslaved people that they encountered. Um, I, I would argue that many, uh, and in fact, perhaps most Northern soldiers were opponents of slavery. Um, but this is the key issue. And this is what I think surprised folks last week. Anti-slavery feelings could coincide with racism, right? Opposition to slavery did not mean that someone was a racial egalitarian. Um, it did not mean that someone was even really an abolitionist, right? But what Northern soldiers were beginning to realize throughout the war was that the power of the Confederacy was largely um, in its, in its uh, slave labor population. And that if they could disintegrate slavery, um, that they would dramatically weaken the Confederacy. And that's something that we're gonna talk about in the next lecture when I deal with the question of emancipation. Um, but I just want you to try and hold on to these two seemingly competing ideas, but, but I don't think these are actually competing ideas. Many Northern soldiers were deeply racist. Many Northern politicians, uh, in fact, most were deeply racist and they were working to destroy uh, race-based slavery in America. Um, okay, so um, let's think about what's happening in the war in the year 1862. You'll remember that um, I, I mentioned this briefly in the last lecture, and I just want to emphasize now, throughout 1861, the first year of the war, those months following Fort Sumter, leading up to Bull Run, um, there's a lot of hesitance. There's a lot of caution on the sides of both war, uh, both armies. There's not a lot of great significant battles happening. 
Um, and that's because both sides wanted a limited war. Okay, the Confederates wanted to fight just long enough to make the federal government acknowledge that they were independent. The longer the war went, the more dangerous it would become, the more they would lose that strength that they had to claim their own independence. At the same time, it's the stated policy of the Lincoln administration um, to keep the war limited, to keep the war from becoming, and this is how Lincoln put it, a remorseless revolutionary struggle. We have to find a way to create some boundaries around this thing, right? Because what Lincoln's realizing is that this could spread across the continent and it could be um, a sort of undoing of governing power all across North America. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to talk about how the Confederate rebellion influenced and spread into the far American West, particularly among Native Americans. Um, so by the summer of 1862, exactly what Lincoln fears, that remorseless revolutionary struggle is what comes to, to be true, right? That's what the war becomes. Here's how the historian Bruce Catton put it. By August of 1862, America's tragedy was that it was caught between the tragedy of going on with the war and the human impossibility of stopping it. The two poles here, go on with the war and it's impossible to stop it. There is, there is no way around those two truths. And so the only way forward is to slaughter one another. Okay, that's, that's the circumstance here um, that the events I'm gonna talk about today really lead Americans to realize. 1862 is like a year of recognition it's a year of realization. This won't be a limited war. This will be grueling and it's going to come down to the last man standing. Okay. Um, the union for its part um, has a real crisis of leadership in 1862. The, the defining issue of union politics in this year is conflict between leading generals and the presidential administration. Um, George McClellan, who you see here, he's the commanding general of the Union Army. Uh, he's young, he's only 34 years old. Um, he is, uh, and I, I should say, the commanding general of the Army of the Potomac, which is the sort of largest branch of the Union Army. It's in Virginia, um, it's based in Washington, D.C., um, and McClellan's in charge of that branch of the Army. Okay. He spends um, the year 1861 after the Union defeat at Bull Run, just outside Washington. He spends the rest of the year training soldiers. He parades them, um, but he does at, at no um, instance will he lead them into war, right? He will not take his troops into battle. He is incredibly cautious. He has a habit of overestimating the size of his opponent's army. Um, and so he always is holding back. Um, I should also say McClellan was a hateful of Abraham Lincoln. He called Lincoln a baboon. He called him a gorilla. Um, McClellan was a Democrat. So that's the opposite party of Lincoln. McClellan was pro-slavery. He was completely opposed to the idea of using the war to end slavery. He did not think that was a legitimate war aim. All he wanted to do was stop the rebellion, repair the union, and kind of try to get back to the way things were in the 1850s. Okay, so McClellan philosophically opposes what, what Lincoln philosophically supports as a war effort, um, and the two clash endlessly. Um, and they also clash because Lincoln wants to fight the war he wants to seize every single opportunity possible to stop Confederate forces in their tracks and um, end the rebellion as quickly as he can. Um, so that's what's happening in uh, Northern Virginia and Washington, DC uh, through much of the winter of 1861 and into 1862. It's conflict between these two major figures. Out West, it's a slightly different story. 
Um, this is what we call the river war um, in the West, the river war in Tennessee. When I say the West right now, I just mean West of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, it's not a region of the country today that we would think of as the West, but it was um, often characterized that way in the 1860s. Um, we're gonna move much further West. We're gonna move out into the plains, into Minnesota and the Dakotas uh, in a little bit. So Tennessee is the first major site of combat in the war. Um, and its geography really shows us why. If you don't have a, a map of Tennessee in your mind right now, I got one for you. Okay, for one thing, it borders Union states, right? Kentucky never seceded, Missouri never seceded, um, and, it's, and it's quite close to Southern Illinois as well. Um, so that makes it significant right there, right? If the Confederacy can seize and hold on to Tennessee, um, and Tennessee had seceded by the way, if the Confederacy can hold on to that territory, it pushes the boundary of its territory north. And if the Union can seize it, it pushes uh, its boundary south, right? Uh, but also, it lies along the Mississippi River to its west, right? And controlling the Mississippi River is gonna be tremendously important because it's really the gateway to the continent. It's the gateway to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and if the Union controls the Mississippi River, it effectively severs um, a significant portion of the Confederacy from itself, right? It creates this harsh boundary between Louisiana and Texas on one side and Arkansas on one side and the rest of the Confederacy on the other. Um, and it essentially fragments the Confederacy into two massive territories. Um, and then for another reason that Tennessee is important is it has two very pivotal waterways within its borders. Um, and these are the Tennessee rivers and the uh, the Tennessee River and the Cumberland River. And as you can see on this map here, um, this is the Tennessee. It runs sort of directly south and into Alabama. And this is the Cumberland. It sort of dips down. It runs through Nashville and then it cuts back up into Kentucky. Uh, why are these so important? Well, on this map, what you see. Uh, are a bunch of interstate highways because this is a 21st century map, you see I-24, I-65. Those don't exist, obviously, in the 1860s. Um, and so these rivers are the transit corridors. These are like the highways, right? If you can control these rivers, then you can move troops and supplies in and out of this territory. Um, or if you're the Confederacy and you control these rivers, you can continue uh, moving not only troops and supplies, but you can have commerce, right? You can move goods um, and the Confederacy needs to maintain some kind of economic productivity um, or else it's going to run out of steam. So um, by February 1862, both rivers become important sites of Union attack. Um, and after capturing crucial forts on the rivers, the Union captures the city of Nashville uh, in the spring of 1862. So that's the first major Confederate city to fall in the war. At the same time, the Confederate army is beginning to take shape in Northern Mississippi. Remember, this is the winter of 62, so the war is not even a year old. Um, and lacking sort of contemporary, what we would expect from contemporary transportation, it's taking a while for the South to mobilize its forces, right? You've got, you've got potential soldiers pouring out of extremely rural places in Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and out into further West Texas. And it's gonna take these guys a while. So by the winter of 62, they're really just starting to congregate and come together. And they're doing that in a place called Corinth, Mississippi. It's where I put this star here. It's in Northeastern Mississippi, um, right near the border with Tennessee. Okay. Um, this is the largest Confederate force to, to come together in uh, the Deep South by this point. So what we have is two armies that are really converging on the same area. In command of Union forces in Tennessee is um, this guy, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant was a sort of irrelevant figure through the late 1850s. 
Um, and by the time the war started, he was just working in his brother's shop in his hometown in Illinois. As regiments begin forming in Illinois, um, Grant as a West Point grad suddenly has a little bit of cachet um, and he is put in charge. Um, and because he does well quickly, he, he rises to the position of Brigadier General. And if you go back to that map, you can see Illinois is actually quite close to, not only does the Mississippi River run down Illinois, um, but it's actually quite close to the South. And so Grant and his men are gonna move down through Illinois and into this region that we're talking about here in the Deep South. Um, the two armies come together, they confront one another um, in early April after amazing Confederate surprise, Confederates uh, wrapped their shoes in cloth so that they couldn't be heard marching and they moved in from the town of Corinth. Um, Union forces had landed down low on the Tennessee River near this place called Shiloh, um, actually at a place called Pittsburgh Landing. Um, and this is the first truly cataclysmic war, a battle of the war. Um, this, is, this is a moment where people begin to realize that this war could be horrific, that the costs of the war could go far beyond what anyone had imagined. And it really shocks the soldiers who survive it. Um, as one uh, soldier puts it, I could have walked across that field as far as the eye could see and never touched the ground by walking on the bodies. Okay, there's uh, competing estimates here, but roughly 23,000 troops were either killed or wounded at Shiloh. That is double the combined number of all previous casualties, right? It's, it's a devastatingly high number. Among those killed was the commanding general of Confederate forces, um, Albert Sidney Johnson. So going into the war, it's really Grant is commanding for the Union and Johnston is the leading figure for the Confederacy. He's killed. Um, that is a crushing blow. He's one of the most important military minds in the South. Um, and that comes very early in the war. Um, so after that initial Confederate su surprise, uh, the Union repels the advance. Um, they repel the onslaught. They eventually win the battle, but it's sort of a Pyrrhic victory. Um, the cost is extremely high, um, but in the end, the Confederates never hold um, this territory again, right? So that pivotal access to the Tennessee River and up into the state itself of Tennessee um, is lost to the Confederacy forever, okay? The big lesson um, in addition to that strategic outcome of the battle, the big lesson is this idea of a limited war that I was talking about a few moments ago, this idea of a quick war that we can just get through um, and solve our problems, that's, that's effectively dead. Um, here's what Grant wrote later on in his life. It was at Shiloh, he said, that the Union, he realized that the Union could never be preserved except by complete conquest of the South, except by complete conquest of the South, right? We will never push them back and then get to negotiate. We will never coax them back with the carrot. Grant believes the destruction must be complete. It must be utter. And when we talk about the war effort, especially in the year 1864, when Grant is leading forces in Virginia, we're going to see him making that belief come to life. Um, and the costs are going to be astounding. Uh, for Union troops as well as Confederate troops. But the belief is we're going to have to sacrifice everything um, in order to crush them. There's no other way around it. Uh, and, and he learns that lesson here at the Battle of Shiloh, April of 1862. So let's go back to Virginia now. General McClellan, he, um, he is trying to move his Army of the Potomac from Washington, D.C. Uh, towards the city of Richmond. McClellan is, as I said, he's very slow, he's very cautious, and he's working under this belief that we should avoid battles at all costs. We don't want any battles. 
All we want to do is have some small skirmishes, push them back, push them back, and then we'll take Richmond. Okay, his belief is if we capture the capital, that that's the key victory. The problem, oh, and I'll show you a couple maps here of what McClellan's up to. This is Washington, DC, the blue star. This is the city of Richmond down here with the gray star. So McClellan has moved down Chesapeake Bay, and then his forces are moving up the York River here, and then up the James River, and as well up this peninsula here. Okay, and they're making their way towards Richmond. They lay siege to the city of Yorktown, famous from the Revolutionary War. George Washington had a famous victory there. Um, they've laid siege to Yorktown and they are now moving their way slowly, slowly, slowly up the peninsula. Um, last week we read a letter from Charles Brewster describing his experiences in the war and Brewster, um, I believe was writing from Washington DC, but had participated in uh, this campaign, this peninsular campaign. So the problem with McClellan's strategy as Lincoln saw it and as Grant would see it is that the Confederacy wasn't its capital, right? It didn't really matter where the Confederate capital was. The leaders of the Confederate government could vacate Richmond and they could go down to Petersburg. They could go over to Lynchburg. They could go, they could go back to Montgomery, Alabama right? What mattered was the armies. The Confederacy was its armies. And as long as those armies still had power, the Confederacy would survive. Um, but McClellan doesn't see things quite that way. As McClellan is uh, making his way, here's a close-up, by the way, um, if this is helpful for you. This is that peninsula, York River, uh, the U.S. Navy moving up the James River, Richmond here to the far left. Um, some of these battle maps I find overwhelming. They're, they're very complex. Um, so as um, McClellan is making his way up the peninsula, um, another Confederate general, uh, Stonewall Jackson, has moved his men out into the Shenandoah Valley. And I'm going to show you where that is. Here's a picture of Stonewall Jackson, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, one of the most famous figures from the American Civil War. Um, the Shenandoah Valley is up here. It's the gray bar, and I'm using gray there. That, so that suggests it's in this region the Confederate forces are sort of moving up and down the valley, up and down the valley. And what they're doing um, is they're terrifying the Union, right, intentionally. He's spreading fear. Folks in D.C. are wondering, is Jackson going to attack Washington? Um, folks in Maryland are wondering, is Jackson going to invade Maryland. Um, and what this does is it pulls thousands of troops who otherwise would have gone down to the peninsula to support McClellan, and it draws them into the Shenandoah Valley to deal with uh, Stonewall Jackson. It also draws troops under John C. Fremont from West Virginia. They have to come back over the mountains and try to track this guy down. And this is, this is the moment where Stonewall Jackson becomes a famous person. Because what he does is he moves so quickly that he's able to sever um, much larger forces than he has. He has far fewer men than these Union forces do, but he's able to kind of catch them on their heels continually and sort of punch them in the nose and punch them in the nose and punch them in the nose and then keep moving. Um, he's like a really pesky bee or a hornet or something like that, right? Um, and it's, it's exhausting Union supplies and it's distracting Union efforts. Um, and it's the reason that McClellan, it's one of the key reasons that McClellan does not succeed in his effort to take Richmond. Okay, this whole process in Virginia, it culminates in June with a series of battles known as the Seven Days Battles. These are out um, in Southeastern Virginia um, and the eventual result here is that Confederate forces repel McClellan's surge against Richmond, in part because McClellan lacks soldiers that he could have used who are otherwise um, dealing with Stonewall Jackson. Here we have an image. Um, just a couple of other quick consequences of this before I show you the image. Um, again, this is following the trajectory that we see at Shiloh. 
casualties are mounting, they're getting higher and higher. So across five battles in the course of or around a week, you have 36,000 major casualties. Um, the uh, seven days battles provide a huge boost in Confederate morale, right? There's a moment after Shiloh where it seems like this is not gonna work out. This is doomed. But suddenly you have a striking series of victories and you defend the capital. And you also have this rising hero in Jackson who performs these sort of brilliant acts of military daring out in the Shenandoah. Um, and now the Confederacy has heroes. Um, and now the Confederacy has a couple of key victories to really give it faith in its effort. Um, and then the other consequence here is that Robert E. Lee um, is named the commander of all Confederate forces in the East, right? Lee is sort of the heroic figure um, of the, the Seven Days Battles. He comes out of that with a much higher commission and he's gonna take control after this. Okay, here's that picture, um, an illustration. This is the Battle of Malvern Hill, one of the Seven Days Battles. So Robert E. Lee, is now in command. I, I, I have to imagine that everybody in the class has heard of Robert E. Lee, at least or heard his name. Um, he is the most iconic figure of the Confederacy, without question. Um, if you see an image of him, I'm sure you'll recognize it. Uh, he is often, uh, some, some form of his image or his name is often replicated in popular culture. Still today, you cannot travel through the American South without encountering a some kind of public institution that's named after him, whether it's a school or park or what have you. Um, and uh, you, you probably can't travel through the South without finding a statue of him. They're in almost every Southern town. Um, and this is kind of the moment where Lee becomes Lee, right? Um, as you'll remember, Albert Sidney Johnson is killed at Shiloh. He's the other sort of major figure in the Confederate world. So he's dead um, and Lee is sort of the unquestioned figurehead now of Confederate military efforts. So what's he gonna do? Um, soon after he's named Confederate of all Confederate forces in the Eastern, commander of all Confederate forces in the Eastern theater, um, Lee makes the decision that he's gonna invade the North, okay? Um, he does this for a couple of different reasons. For one, all of what I just described is happening in Virginia. So Virginia is, is being decimated by the war, right? Different regions uh, from the Shenandoah out west, down southeast all the way to Yorktown. Um, it's getting bombarded. Its crops are destroyed. Um, its infrastructure is destroyed. Okay, its men are being killed um, at a rapid rate. So Virginia uh, is exhausted and he wants to try and pull pressure away from that state, which is so, that state is so important to the Confederacy. Um, number two, he wants to, to terrify um, Northerners. Okay, he wants to threaten Washington DC and he wants to threaten Philadelphia. I wanna be clear here, he doesn't necessarily wanna like invade these cities, right? He doesn't wanna occupy Philadelphia and then slowly invade all of the North, right? He knows that that's not gonna work, but if he can terrify them, if he can put the fear of God into them, he might destabilize politics in the North. And that is really above everything else, that's the Confederacy's goal in this war. It's to um, essentially rob the Lincoln administration of legitimacy, turn the political winds against the Republican party, that anti-slavery party, bring a unionist party into power, perhaps a pro-slavery party into power and end the war through negotiations with them. That's their way out of this. Um, and so by threatening DC and Philadelphia, Lee could advance that goal. Another key issue here is um, he wants to attract British support. Um, if nothing else, he's thinking a successful invasion into the North might coax the British into simply recognizing the Confederacy, saying that this is a legitimate government. They never actually do this, although they do more tacitly support the Confederacy at various points because of commercial relations, cotton, so crucial to British industry. Um, 
And more than anything, Lee is, is very hopeful that perhaps the British would lend naval support um, and, and support the Confederate war effort that way, perhaps make war on the Union naval blockade of the South, which is preventing the South from, from carrying out, um, to some extent, preventing the South from carrying out trade with foreign countries. Um, Lee also wants to attract some support from border states. Like I said, the Virginia men are, are pretty wiped by the experiences of the spring of 1862. Maryland is a pro-slavery state. Um, it's a heavily democratic state. It is an anti-Lincoln state, but it never seceded. Um, and so he is hopeful that as his army moves into Maryland, uh, men will, will join up. They don't uh, because they get one look at Confederate soldiers who are half starved, they're poorly clothed, they're, um, they're exhausted, they're broken down, they're wounded. Um, they get one look at that army and they say that they're just gonna stay back home. Um, one thing they do get uh, out of their trips into Maryland and later uh, into Pen Pennsylvania um, is enslaved people. Right, Lee's army is an enslaving army. It's a kidnapping army. Um, it seizes enslaved people and impresses them into work uh, for the army. Um, it's important to keep that in mind. I think sometimes there's like a cute distinction that Confederate apologists make um, that Lee was somehow uh, not interested in the issue of slavery. Um, he was a slaveholder himself. Um, he came from a family of slaveholders. You could not be elite in the South without being a slaveholder. And his army was an enslaving army. It's really important to keep that in mind. Um, okay. So Lee moves into Maryland. Those are his goals and he's going to move into Maryland. Um, this map, this one's probably not my best, but you can see I've got these three gray lines and they run um, along this border between, this is now West Virginia here, up here, um, and then down into Virginia, and then in Virginia here, right? Sort of running alongside Maryland and moving north. The blue box over here, this is Washington, DC. Um, and the entire, this is by the late summer of 1862, basically the entire Union Army in the East is in Washington, DC. Okay, uh, Lee's Army, uh, these gray lines, they're spread pretty wide and thin. They're spread across about 60 miles of Western Maryland. They move up into Western Maryland. Um, and sort of by one of the great flukes of the Civil War, Lee sends a message to um, the other branches of his army asking them to congregate here at Sharpsburg, Maryland, where this red dot is. Um, he wraps them around cigars. The messenger somehow loses the message. A Union soldier picks up the cigars, uh, finds a letter, sees that it's signed by R.E. Lee, recognizes that he's heard that name somewhere before, hands it over, and within a day, um, the entire Union military knows that Lee is going to try to congregate at Sharpsburg. I, it sounds almost like a fable, but it is, it is what happened here. Um, Lee uh, realizes that, he, <laughs> that the message may have been lost and tries to double time and get himself to Sharpsburg as quickly as possible. Um, and he's going against, again, George McClellan, who does not move as quickly as possible based on this uh, intelligence. In fact, he's not sure if he believes it. It takes him a while to decide that it's legitimate finally does and starts moving slowly, slowly, slowly towards Sharpsburg. If he had moved more quickly, this might have been a different experience here, but he did not. So he makes his way slowly towards Sharpsburg. And on September 17th, 1862, um, two uh, armies encounter each other um, at a place called Antietam. Um, and it is the bloodiest day in American history. It is one of the darkest days in American history. 23,000 casualties, 5,000 dead. Um, it's certainly the bloodiest day of the war. It's not the bloodiest battle of the war, but it's only a one day. Um, 
experience, so it is the bloodiest day. Um, a photographer, a very famous photographer named Matthew Brady um, and his assistants captured the after aftermath of what happened at Antietam um, in an October of 1862 that had uh, a gallery opening in New York City called the Dead of Antietam. And these are some of the most famous images that come out of the American Civil War. Um, these are Confederate dead along the Hagerstown Road um, outside uh, the battle. Um, for, for many Northerners, this was a major turning point in how they experienced the war. They had heard about the carnage at Shiloh, which had been a few months earlier. They had heard about the carnage of um, the Seven Days Battles. Um, but Matthew Brady brought that carnage home to New York in a very visceral way, um, in a way that is imprinted on how we still today think about the American Civil War. Um, the New York Times wrote this about, about Brady's images. They bring home to us the terrible reality and earnestness of war. If he has not brought bodies and laid them in our dooryards and along streets, he has done something very like it. Okay, there's no real escaping in the Northern imagination uh, what the cost of the war is going to be. Um, certainly after Shiloh and after the Seven Days and now after Antietam, and these images are sort of like images are sort of like a punctuation mark, right? They are a punctuation mark on this grueling stretch um, of about four months. Um, in the wake of Antietam, uh, a number of very significant developments occur. Uh, number one, the battle stops Lee's invasion of the North. Okay, it's not the last time he's going to try and invade the North. Uh, and we'll talk about that the next time I give a lecture here. Um, there's a moment where McClellan perhaps could have ended the war right here. This could have been it. Um, and what he could have done was advance upon Lee who has the Potomac River at his back. Okay, Lee is in an extremely vulnerable position for a brief time. McClellan holds back. Um, he also has 20,000 troops that he never used in the battle. So McClellan holds 20,000 troops in reserve. Again, an unbelievably cautious military leader. Careful, careful, careful not to overextend his forces to the point where he doesn't even use his forces. Um, and Lee is able to escape back into Virginia. McClellan does not pursue him. Instead, he stays uh, in Maryland. Abraham Lincoln goes to Antietam soon after the battle. Um, I don't think I have to point out which one is Abraham Lincoln, but you can see McClellan is the one facing him. He's a shorter man um, and he's looking uh, a little bit stubborn towards Lincoln. Um, here's an extremely intimate photo of the two uh, meeting in McClellan's tent to discuss what has happened. And then here's another, this, this is one of the most amazing, amazing pictures from the war. I think it just shows these men in such a human way. Um, and here's one more. Uh, this is an interesting picture to Lincoln's right. The man with his, oh, they both have their hand. The man with the sort of bowler cap um, uh, is uh, Alan Pinkerton. Alan Pinkerton is the founder of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Um, which is sort of like a secret police organization that after the Civil War um, would become notorious for crushing worker uprisings, um, from it, including in places like Butte, Montana. Um, here, Pinkerton is serving as a sort of private security to the president. Um, Lincoln fires McClellan. Um, he has to, okay. Uh, so that's the end of McClellan's um, command. Um, but he also recognizes that the victory at Antietam, although it could have been much greater than it was, is enough that he can begin to make 
the abolition of slavery more of a war aim, more of a conscientious war aim. So after the battle, uh, Lincoln issues what's called the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and what he says here is, if Confederate forces do not uh, surrender by the end of 1862, by December 31st of 1862, uh, he will emancipate the slaves or he will work to emancipate the slaves and it will abolition will become a war aim and a political goal. Okay, so these are some of the crucial consequences of Antietam. I'm just gonna hold off on that for one second. Here's the situation in the fall of 1862. The Confederates are on the doorstep of the Union. They pose a looming threat to Washington um, and the very pro-slavery Confederate sympathizing border state of Maryland. In 1863, they're gonna use that advantage and they're gonna move into Pennsylvania. Um, and that's gonna culminate in the Battle of Gettysburg. Both sides, by the end of this year, by the end of this long summer, um, are bearing down for a pretty grim, uh, long battle. The South has some hope, right? They scored important victories in Virginia. Um, and by invading the North, they still have hope that they can destroy Lincoln's political power um, and end the war that way. But the Union has hope as well, right? They've won important battles at Shiloh and Antietam. They've also, uh, though, lacked clear leadership. They've been in some disarray. Uh, it's, a, it's a disorganized early uh, war for the Union. There's no obvious leader for the Northern Army. Um, we're about to enter a phase where Lincoln's constantly finding different generals to try and lead and is constantly dissatisfied and frustrated by them. Um, and many people in the North now after seeing Matthew Brady's photos and after hearing reports from Shiloh and Antietam in seven days are beginning to brace themselves for a much more gruesome war than they had ever imagined, certainly than they'd imagined only a year before in 1861. So that's a quick update on military developments in the early phase of the war. Um, I just want to turn further west to a place that all of us are much more familiar with, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> remember all of the precipit precipitating events of the sectional crisis in the 1850s, all that stuff that led up to secession, all the stuff that caused the war, right? Um, it was about the West, the Mexican War, California statehood, the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Bleeding Kansas, all of these things had to do with this central political question of the age, right? Would the new territories of the West be slave or free, right? Uh, would the nation expand and maintain its balance between slave and free states? Would it become all one or the other? Okay, so it's always about the West in the end. And the Confederacy and the Union didn't forget that, um, that the West was the prize. Right? It remains the prize throughout the war. Um, and they're going to focus at least some of their attention on the West um, throughout the war. Let's think about what's going on in the West and from the Confederacy's perspective. For one, um, California and Oregon were Union states, but they boasted significant numbers of Confederate sympathizers. They were not, they were not comfortably in the Union and behind the war effort. Um, they were democratic states, meaning that they, they were likely to oppose Lincoln's leadership. Um, another territory, Utah, um, is largely populated by Mormons who have existed in violent tension with the federal government, um, throughout the 1850s to the point where federal troops, uh, invaded and fought wars with Mormons during the late 1850s in the administration of James Buchanan. Um, the territory of New Mexico was led by Southerners. The governor was a Southerner um, and it had a slave code. So it's very possible that these territories could perhaps jump ship and join the Confederacy or that they could remain somewhat neutral and refuse to support the Union um, or that they could just sort of directly find ways to support the Confederacy without actually joining it. Um, 
the Confederacy is most uh, concerned, at least initially, not with forging these relations further west, but um, forging alliances in Indian country. Um, this is the region that we know of today as Oklahoma. It was there that the southeastern tribes, such as the Cherokees, the Seminoles, uh, Cheeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws, um, they'd been forcibly relocated during the 1830s. Um, we know this is the Trail of Tears era. Uh, the great irony here is that they were forcibly relocated to make, to open up territory to slave agriculture, right? To cotton agriculture. Um, that was the purpose of relocation. Um, and now the, the slave owning state, right? The pro-slavery Confederacy is making overtures with them to join them. Um, and, it, and it goes quite well, actually. Uh, the Confederacy promises, in addition to sort of gifts and financial support, they promise much greater sovereignty to the tribes than they had under the Union. Um, and they even promise representation in the Confederate government, something that native people in the 19th century could never imagine in the American government. Um, and so more than half a dozen tribes effectively joined the Confederate war effort early on here. Um, and from there, Confederate President Jefferson Davis, he sends emissaries out to Mexico. He builds alliances, not with the, the federal government in Mexico, but with Northern states that border um, the Southwestern American territories, places like Sonora and Chihuahua. Um, the Confederate government raised volunteers in Texas to storm across the Southwest. And by early 1862, um, they'd actually seized the cities of Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and they were moving north up into Colorado. So the Confederacy is expanding its boundaries as much as it can into the West, okay? Even as it's struggling to control Tennessee and to hold on to Tennessee, it's focused on moving further west. For its part, um, the Union has to keep a very close eye on developments in the West. Unlike the Confederacy, um, which could exploit resentment and play up old historical tensions um, and hatreds between groups in the West and the federal government, um, the Union has to try and suppress uh, animosity, suppress resentment. It has to hold on to what it already has as opposed to um, pushing a wedge between its enemy and these groups in the West, right? Um, and this this was true all across the West, but it was most true and it, or it became at least most apparent, most clearly apparent in the Northern Plains, um, uh, a region where native people uh, in the early 1860s are gonna recognize that the Union is otherwise indisposed and that this could be a very powerful opportunity to, to leverage um, the Civil War, the war between the Union and the Confederacy to their own benefit and begin carving out more autonomy and pushing settlers out of their homelands. This is part of, this is part of a very long history of um, oppressed, peoples using larger wars to leverage their own claims, right? You see this, another example of this is Ireland in World War I launches a rebellion against Britain while Britain's indisposed with the war on the continent, right? This is a very, this is a common move and it's a smart move. It's, this could be your best possible opportunity um, to push back against someone who's, who has a lot more power than you do. Okay, so that's, that's the motivation here. The largest of these rebellions is um, launched by the Dakotas, um, who had been attempting for decades to fend off federal officials and white settlers. They'd really been under siege um, for, for 20 plus years um, by settlers who were encroaching onto their homelands, particularly in Southern Minnesota. This is very fertile territory um, very game rich territory. It's a very important place for white settlers and for Dakotas. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure building up there in the 1840s and 1850s, a lot of tension over this land. Um, the Dakotas had been losing out. Um, and by the 1850s, starvation is rampant. Um, displacement is really the rule. Um, 
and things are, are looking quite grim. As they got word though um, of Southern victories in 1862, right? They're getting word of things like um, the seven days battles. And they're starting to see that maybe the union might not make it or they'll struggle so much with the Confederacy that they won't have a chance to control their territory out here. Um, and so several weeks before the Battle of Antietam, the Dakota chief Little Crow uh, leads a band of warriors to destroy a federal agency outpost. Um, other bands murdered white settlers. They attack federal forts. Um, and this was the beginning of an episode known as the Dakota War. Um, the Dakota War spreads in one form or another, whether through actual violence or just through fear and paranoia, it spreads across a vast region. It spreads from Minnesota out to the Dakotas, um, into Iowa and Nebraska, and even into Wisconsin, all during the fall of 1862. This is not our war, uh, wrote Minnesota's governor to the federal government. It is a national war. He's saying, this is, this is the fate of the Union right here. Lincoln um, is deeply unsettled by this. Uh, Lincoln fears that the Dakota uprising is sort of like a second front in the war that's exposed Union vulnerability, not just to the South, but also to the far West. Um, he's very concerned about having enough resources and people to fight a large scale war out on the plains. Um, and so he, he moves pretty quickly. He sets up an, a new department of the army called the Department of the Northwest. He places in its command um, a man named John Pope, who's been humiliated at a couple of important battles in 1862. And this is sort of like a banishment for him. It's how he sees it. Um, but Pope takes to the work in um, the most gruesome way possible. He writes that his purpose is to utterly exterminate the Sioux if I have the power to do so. He's referring to the, to the Dakotas when he says the Sioux. Um, they are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromises can be made. By October, Pope had imprisoned uh, roughly 2,000 people. Um, he sentenced 303 Dakotas to death. Um, Lincoln himself then reviews that evidence um, he scales that back. Uh, he reduces it to 38. And on December 26, 1862, federal officials executed 38 uh, Dakota men in the town of Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, and that is the largest mass execution in U.S. history. So we have in a couple of months here, we have the bloodiest day, single day in American history at Antietam, and now the largest mass execution in an attempt on the Union's part to maintain its dominance over Native people on the plains. Um, that is a tragic turn in the story. It's not the end of the story. The following year, um, the federal government voided all treaties with the Dakotas. Uh, it stripped them of their reservation. Okay, they were now a homeless people. Uh, it forced them into the open plains uh, without, without a homeland. Uh, John Pope stuck around through 1863. So for the whole next year, he would be there, this person who had promised um, that he would exterminate them, uh, exterminate the Dakotas. Um, he, he continues hunting down native people long after the execution at Mankato. Um, he murders those who have nothing to do with the uprising, those who were nowhere near any of the uprisings of the Dakota War. And in July, his men kill uh, Little Crow um, and send his scalp for preservation to the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, aside from the profound tragedy and misery of this, of the Dakota War, uh, it's significant for two reasons. The first is that it reminds us that the West remained essential to the war effort. Um, that the Civil War was in fact a continental war. It wasn't just about Virginia. It wasn't just about Tennessee. Um, second, 
the Dakota War reminds us um, that of a sort of grim future to come, right? The Dakota War is like the opening round um, in a, a series of uprisings, uh, a series of extremely bloody massacres and wars to come um, that are going to define the relationship between Native people and the federal government during the last third of the 19th century after the Civil War. And that's going to spread much further west, of course, than Minnesota, and it's going to go into Montana and Idaho and California and Colorado and Nevada, etc. Uh, we're going to return to that story uh, at the end of the course when we're talking about Reconstruction, when we're talking about the post-war period. Um, but what we see is it's already beginning, even though the Civil War itself is, is just beginning. Okay, so I've painted a very chaotic picture of the state of things in this early phase of the war in 1862. It is, a, is an absolutely brutal year. Um, as I said, we're going to, this week, we're going to discuss how everyday average civilian people were living amidst all of this chaos. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you. Um, as always, you can let me know if you have any questions. Okay, talk to you soon, everybody.